It now being past 4.30, I need to propose the question that the House do now adjourn. <laughs> the question now is that the House do now adjourn. All that, is that, that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order, lock the doors. Uh, bear with me.
All right. The question is that the House do now adjourn. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Gray and Dawson tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Fowler and Morton tell us for the nose. If members could face the front so the tellers can recognise you.
Order. The res result of the division is ayes 67, noes 69. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. Yeah, yeah. I now call the member for Graham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I move that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting the following words. The message be taken into consideration at 5.20 pm today or the first available opportunity thereafter. The is the, is the motion seconded? The member for McMahon Mr. and reserve your right to speak. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, you hadn't actually put the question, no. so therefore he couldn't move the amendment. Yeah, but we, did, we, we don't actually know what's before the House until the Speaker states what is before the House, so you'll have yeah. to do that all again. Well, the, question, the question was, um, prior to the adjournment debate, that the, that the original motion on the message of the Senate be agreed to. The member for Grindler. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I move that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting the following words. The message be taken into consideration at 5.20 pm today or the first available opportunity thereafter. Is the motion second? The motion second. I thank the member for McMahon. He reserves his right to speak, the Leader of the House. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, quite clearly, this is a stunt by the Labor Party about the Royal Commission uh, into financial services and transactions. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. I move that the question be put. The Manager of Opposition Business has moved that the question be put on the amendment. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. I think more than three minutes has elapsed.
Order, lock the doors. The question is that the motion would be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Fowler and Morton tell us for the eyes, the honourable members for Gray and Dawson tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is I 71, no 70. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the amendment be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. Division required. Division required. I think the noes have it. The aye. The aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. And I appoint the tellers as per the previous division. Reminder, this is a one-minute division. It would be helpful if members were to remain in their seats unless they're leaving the chamber or did not vote in the previous division or if they're changing their vote, in which case they need to report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Members must remain in their seat unless they're changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Here you go, Mr. Perry, 71 number.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 71, noes 70. The question is therefore re resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. And I call the Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr. It, Speaker. it takes a tackless stunt to try and force a tackless stunt. Mr Treasurer resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business now has the call. I move that the question be put. The Manager of Opposition Business has moved that the question be put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Uh, all, all those of that opinion uh, pass the right of the chair, the nose to the left, and I appoint the same tellers as per the previous division.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 71, noes 71. The question is therefore tied and requires me as Speaker to exercise a casting vote uh, as members uh, would be aware the principles uh, uh, regarding a casting vote by the Speaker are outlined in House of Representatives practice, specifically on page 183, uh, and they include that the Speaker should vote to allow further discussion where this is possible. I therefore cast my vote with uh, the noes, and that is against um, closure of the debate. No. You can't. No, the member for Kennedy answered his own question. <laughs> the Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You can't take a point of order out of your seat. You what we're your seeing question. here this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, is a stunt, a stunt from an opposition to promote their stunt, which is the Royal Commission, Mr. Speaker. A Royal Commission for which they have no terms of reference. A Royal Commission that is motivated just by just by one thing, Mr. Speaker and that is for the Leader of the Opposition to recklessly and cruelly manipulate and use the genuine pain and the genuine the concerns of people warned. in Australia to promote his own political self-interest. Mr. Speaker. That is what the Leader of the Opposition is seeking to do here this afternoon. He is using a stunt to promote his stunt, Mr. Speaker, because what we know on this side of the House is when there are serious issues to be dealt with, particularly in the banking and financial system, then you deal with them. You address them. You take action, Mr. Speaker. That's what you do. And what we know is, as they came into this place today at question time and they raised genuine concerns by the constituents— The Treasurer's time has expired. The Deputy Prime Minister has Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, I think it's incredibly important that we clearly understand that there is the capacity for the oversight and the proper delivery of an outcome with the facilities that are currently at our disposal, and we in the government are prepared to put more to it if it's required. But the idea that we would start a royal commission for a royal commission's purpose, which has no power to prosecute, which has no, the, not the same powers as what we see in such see what the, the I, member I, and, the, and the what member we actually for Hunter what we see here will cease is that in our capacity to make sure that we as look after the member for such people as the farmers, that we stand behind such things as a regional investment corporation, a regional investment corporation to properly facilitate looking after farmers. And I take the interjection from the member for Hunter because we are the people that got the concessional loans out. Going out of this, at this current time at 2.66 per cent, we have seen well in excess of 430, I think it's close to $480 million well in excess of $450 million now being lent out in concession loans. We are the people that are making sure that we deliver packages to people in regional areas to look after them. We are the same side of politics that is looking after people with the farm household allowance, making sure we keep dignity, dignity to on the for people on the farm, on the land. We are making sure that this is delivered. I note, I note with absolute, uh, with, 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 with fascination, that we get an interjection Members on from the Labor left Party. Will take the their same Labor or Party the that when milk prices went down to 27 Members cents a on litre in Victoria, take they did nothing or about leave it. The they did nothing about it. All they can do, all the Labor Party can do, is come up with stunts. They are not a government. They are not an opposition. They are a circus, a circus that believes in stunts, a stunts that stand in proxy for being, a, for, for being any, even a vague semblance of what a government might be. But, um, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy. I'm happy to stay here for as long as it takes to make sure that people clearly understand that those on the other side, those in the opposition, are not worthy of the Treasury benches. They are not worthy of the Treasury benches. They have never come up with one idea, one idea in their hundred, in the hundred ideas they had of a positive agenda for people, and, uh, for their positive agenda at the last election. Not one, not one for people on the land. In fact, as close as they got was to increase the regulation around tree clearing to put a further caveat on people who live on the land. All they want to deliver to people on the land is nothing or further, or further regulation to make their life more difficult. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, it is a, an, an interesting day, an interesting day when we're talking about probity, when we're talking about how things could be done better. And this is the same week where we hear for people such as Senator Sam Dastyari receiving a receiving more than $1,600 $1, from an organisation which has close ties with the Chinese government, and they just brush it over. They don't worry about that. They don't, worry, they don't have the ticker to stand up and actually make a statement and do something about that. You'd think that the Leader of the Opposition would have the capacity, when it's asked of him, to show real leadership, to actually make a statement, to actually show the Australian people the sort of person he would be or he wants to be, that he does not have the ticker to stand up to Sam Dastyari. It's obviously that the faceless men have more power than the Leader of the Opposition. It's quite obvious that if people want to hear something, if they want to say back later on at night, then the Australian people should hear this. The Australian people should hear that Sam Dastyari received in more than $1,600 from an organisation closely associated with the Chinese government and then had the temerity to make statements about the key, argu key arguments of our nation's defence policy, def a defence policy which the Labor Party agrees with, but he wishes to change. Why would he wish to change it? Would it have, have anything to do with his association, an association backed up by a payment of $1,600 that has is been made him? In fact, not only that, not only that, is he said he said he donated to a charity. Even that charity had the decency to see the tainting of that money and handed it back, and handed it back. That charity has more ticker than the Leader of the Opposition, who intends to do nothing about this. He now has the time to show some ticker. He now has the time to do something about this. He now has the time to show his medal. Has this man any medal? That is the question that everybody is asking here tonight. They are not going to be asking about your charade. They are going to be asking about your ticker. Do you have anything? Is there anything inside there? Is there anything inside that shows you have the steel inside you to deal with Senator Sam Dastyari, or is he more powerful than you? Is that really the reality? Is he more powerful than you? Are you actually scared of him? Does he actually run it? Is the Labor Party still run by Sussex Street and you are the, merely their puppet, sitting there just waiting? I mean, this, that's what the Australian people are here. That's what they want to hear about tonight. We'll, we're happy to talk about it. We are going to make sure that if we have to stay here till midnight tonight, this will be the question that we'll be asking people. Why is it? that the Labor Party, when they had their first opportunity, after so much rhetoric that they put on the table over, over, um, over members of the government and with issues when we had to stand people down, and the Labor Party at their first opportunity had nothing, nothing to show for it. They, at the, it was amazing. It was a sound of silence. Every time he mentioned Sam Dastyari's name, Senator Sam Dastyari from New South Wales, silence on the Labor Party's side. Absolute silence. The absolute, the Captain the, Thunderbolt of politics. The Deputy and Prime Minister. Will don't you want resume. a debate? The Deputy don't Prime Minister. Don't you want a debate? Did you want us to say? The Deputy Prime Minister doesn't have the call. The member for Grindler on a yeah, point of order. Going. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Given the provocation and the no, clear the lack of, of relevance, I move that the question be put. Here, 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 here. I'll address. No, well, look. Can I refer you to the standing orders, uh, particularly uh, Standing Order 78? And there's a paragraph at the bottom of you know, A to M that says, "Should any of these questions be negatived, no similar proposals shall be received if the speakers of the opinion that it's an abuse of the orders of the forms of the House." Thank you very much. No, no, on the point of order, the Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Grainler, on the point of order. That, Mr. Speaker, and I, of course, understand that standing order. Mm -hmm. But uh, in between the in between <coughs> the deliberation, in which uh, you determined quite rightly mm -hmm. uh, that uh, to cast your vote uh, in the negative, mm -hmm. uh, quite clearly, uh, if uh, there was a debate of the substance of the motion that was before the chair. But what we're seeing here is All clearly right, just I, the member for Grand the Regime is seat. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister will be relevant to the motion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the issue is that what people want, what people want, is a form of making sure that they get justice. Get justice. They want to get justice because it's only right and proper. Yeah. And that is why we have organisations such as 
ICAC. That is why we have organisations such as such, which have the capacity ASIC. That's why we have the prudential oversight to not only to not only investigate but also to prosecute if it's required to prosecute. And this is incredibly important because people want to get and make sure they have a clear and unambiguous attachment to the form of probity. And the, the question of probity is something that is absolutely fundamental to the parliamentary process. Fundamental to the parliamentary <laughs> process. And probity is never better seen than how people, not only how they act, but how they're deemed to act. And whether there's any questions that call uh, a judgment against that probity. And when that probity is judged, it relies on those, it relies on those who have a leadership position to stand up and show the Australian people that they have, the, that they have their best interests at heart and not, um, not their, their, cer their certain um, affirmed loyalties or their requirement of loyalties uh, to, their, to, to their factional mates. To their factional mates. And what we have seen is that same question, that same desire by people on the land, by people dealing with the banking sector, to say, I want to be treated justly. That justice, which flows down from the top, has to be seen by a parliamentary system that is without question. And when we have a senior front bencher, a senior front bencher from the from the opposition, from the Labor Party, who quite clearly and admits to it himself, is brought into question. So much so that the payment made to him he tried to refund, so much so that the judgment of the charity that he tried to refund it to handed the money back, that this obviously calls into question that there is not the capacity held by the leader of the Labor Party to do the right thing. To I do the right members thing. Interjecting. So, so it is it's, if there's one issue that if we want to be taken, if the Labor Party, if the member for Maribyrnong, if the leader of the opposition wants to be taken seriously by the Australian people, then he had his test this week. And his test this week was to determine whether he had the ticker to stand up to Senator Sam Dastyari, and he never did. He never did. And if the, the people in the banking Prime sector— The Deputy Prime Minister will be relevant to the question. The people, in the, people who are dealing with issues, such as issues with the banking sector, have a right to be heard, and that's why we have the capacity with, with, with things such as ASIC, with organisations such as ASIC, not only to determine what, where things go wrong and not only to determine where justice lies, but also to determine the, and to follow that determination with the capacity the to prosecute. The Deputy Prime Minister's time has expired. The member for Graindler on a Thank point you, of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yes, I now move that the question be put. I'll hear the Leader of the House on the point of order. Mr Speaker, the standing orders and practice is that if a member wants to speak, uh, then the motion having been negatived, moved by the opposition earlier, hmm. if I could just speak yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to hear the Leader of the House in silence. Hmm. Quite clearly, Mr Speaker, the motion that the, the motion be put was defeated. That was negatived. And as a consequence, that can't be moved <coughs> again in the debate. Uh, a similar motion can't be accepted uh, if it would inhibit debate and stop people having the opportunity to make contributions. There's clear ministers and members who clearly would like to make a contribution to this debate, and as a consequence, I don't believe that, in your discretion, that motion from Mr. the member for Grandler can be accepted at this time. Uh, if at some time in a, down the track you thought that there was you know, many more speakers speaking yeah. than necessary, that would be a different matter. We've yeah, well, only the had leader, the two leader speakers the on the, on yeah, the, on the motion. Said. It's um, uh, the assistant uh, treasurer. Resume your seat. The um, manager of government business. Just resume your seat for a second. Obviously, in having ruled on that principle, it doesn't it doesn't mean that uh, a speaker would therefore allow the debate to continue until every single person in the house had had spoken. Uh, it was moved. Uh, the closure was moved uh, on the treasurer, and then it was moved on the very next speaker. I need to allow a reasonable level of debate. I don't at this point think two speakers is a reasonable level of debate, given the number of divisions we've had on the issue and, and <laughs> given I outlined the principle just some time ago. So that's obviously a judgment I need to make. And I, I'll just ask the Leader of the Opposition to resume his seat. I heard the, the, man, the member for Grainler in good faith when the Assistant Treasurer was uh, at the dispatch box. Uh, it's very clear, as I'm explaining this, how I'm ruling, and I'm not going to let, uh, despite the, 
um, the seniority of the Leader of the Opposition for him to jump in ahead of the uh, Assistant Treasurer. All right, then, on that point, if he's seeking the call uh, on the motion, that, that's a, a, a different matter, and I call the Leader of the Opposition. We will never, never, never give up seeking justice for the victims of banks and financial services. We will never, never, never give up seeking a banking royal commission. How pathetic is this government? In our time in government, they opposed every reform we made to financial services. The only other issue they fought as hard was action on climate change. And then we get the Prime Minister with the sheer height of coming in and saying that he's the only person who'll do anything on banking. You can see the fingernail marks in the concrete as they're dragged, kicking and screaming, to action on reform of banking. Every time there was a vote in the previous parliament, 2010 to 2013, every time, not once, not twice, but on 21 separate occasions, these cowards and defendants for malfeasance in the financial services sector voted against Labor reforms. Right. And since then, we've seen more and more scandals. And today, today, I had the privilege and I was humbled to meet victims of financial crimes and financial malfeasance. And this government has the cheek to patronise the victims. What they said is that, oh, there's other means. Don't they understand that the victims we've been seeing have tried to do everything? They've been to the financial ombudsman. They've been to the lawyers. They've dealt with the liquidators. They have been let down from pillar to post. Labor has arrived at the position, recognising that every other measure has proven inadequate. There is a pathology in our banking and financial services system which is sick. It does not mean that we don't want to see banks do well, but I cannot accept the proposition that the only way our banks can be successful is by leaving a trail of misery. The cost of thousands of people losing their financial services and, and accounts and poor treatment by banks, the cost is measured not just in the change down the back of the couch at a Liberal Party function. It is real. Divorces, anxiety, depression. And the most common victims are people in their 50s and 60s, people on the land, people in small business, people who've paid the school fees, who've worked hard and they wanted to put some money aside for their retirement, and they get no justice and they get ripped off. And then these pale apologies over here say there's nothing we can do about the banks. They say that a banking royal commission will change nothing. Well, nothing else has worked. And we've seen this government retreat in an untidy fashion. On April the 10th, the Prime Minister says, nothing to do here, it's all working OK. April the 20th, he then says, maybe we need to look at giving the regulators some more powers. Then after the election, they dream up the idea of a neutered parliamentary committee controlled by the party for big banks, and then they propose, oh, we'll have a tribunal, talk to the victims. The Financial Ombudsman Service can only compensate up to $500,000. They never give awards. They the victims of banking and financial scandals are browbeaten into settlements of ten and twenty thousand dollars, and the people here know that. And this is the party who represents the seedy end of financial planning. They will not go to the centre of the issue, which is the big banks. There is a business model in this country which puts profits ahead of people. We will never give up on this royal commission. The Senate has voted this way. We may succeed tonight, or we may not. But I give the government fair notice on behalf of people who want justice that we do not regard this Royal Commission as anything other than the last resort, long overdue, for justice for a generation of people, a generation of our fellow Australians who have been mistreated and let down by the system. This Commonwealth of ours is a Commonwealth for the people, not a Commonwealth for the banks, and we will never give up. The Assistant Treasurer. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Australian government does recognise that there has been malfeasance and bad behaviour in the financial services sector. We know that it has not always lived up to the expectations of the Australian people. That is why it is this side of the House that is delivering the most significant package of reforms that this parliament has seen, and that is why it is this side of the House that actually held a root and branch review of the financial system, the Murray Financial System Inquiry. Now, did those opposite join us in wanting to hold this root and branch review of the financial system? Did they support us in these endeavours? No, they did not. They did not. In fact, they opposed it. 
On coming into government, they opposed our measures. In fact, when the member for McMahon was the Treasurer, he said, and I quote, the financial system is strong, well regulated and well managed, and I have not seen a case for a full-blown inquiry. Now, this is despite the fact that there were so many financial planning scandals during that time. In fact, during the time that the member for McMahon was the assistant treasurer and also the minister for financial services for more than a thousand days, when he had the power to propose inquiries to actually do something in this space, it was also at a time when the member for Maribyrnong, the leader of the opposition, the man who stood here at the dispatch box with such confected outrage and said that he would have done something if only he'd been given the chance, well, he had that chance when he was the Minister for Financial Services and Superannuation for nearly three years, more than a thousand days. He too could have done something at a time when there were financial scandals. And let me go through them. At a time of their government, there was Opus Prime, there was Storm Financial, there was Trio Capital, there was Great Southern Group, there was the scandals within the CBA financial planning, there was MF Global and Macquarie Equity Limited, there was Banksia, and yet those opposite did not call for a royal commission at that time. In fact, they said that the whole system was incredibly well regulated and that there was nothing to see. Well, in fact, on this side we know that action does need to be taken. We know that the complaints handling for those people who have consumer complaints is simply not good enough. People do need access to justice in a really timely manner. They need to know that their complaints can be heard and that they can access appropriate compensation. We have seen the Financial Ombudsman Service only apply to a certain number of people, and we are looking to expand that, not only to expand that, but to see if there should be a one-stop shop for the Financial Ombudsman Service, the Credit and Investment Ombudsman, and also the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, so that not one consumer falls through the cracks, so that every single one of those people who has a legitimate complaint can be heard and can access appropriate compensation. And that is why this side of the House has instituted the Ramsey Review, so that we can get the governance structure right, so that it won't be years from now that people can access justice, but it will be in the very near future that they will be able to access justice through a one-stop shop. And when we think about consumer complaints, when we think about consumer complaints, I think it's worth noting that the highest number of consumer complaints to the Financial Ombudsman Service occurred at a time that the leader of the opposition was, in fact, the Minister for Financial Services. More than 36,000 complaints at that time. It has, in fact, gone down since then, and it is due to the very, very hard work of putting in place the appropriate changes in regulation and strengthening our regulator that we have seen that number go down. We have invested very, very heavily in our regulator. We know that the regulator needed additional capability and additional resources, which is why we have provided them with significant funding not only to chase down those people who have done the wrong thing, but to be far more proactive in detecting problems before they occur, to stop consumer harm before it actually happens. That's why we have also provided ASIC with $9.2 million in funding to accelerate the implementation of a product intervention power for ASIC so that they can intervene before the harm is done. That is why we have given them more than $61 million to enhance their data analytics and surveillance capabilities and improve their information management systems. That is why we have given them more than $57 million for more surveillance and enforcement activities particularly in the areas of financial advice, responsible lending, life insurance and breach reporting. We know that it's very important that we have a tough cop on the beat. On this side of the House, we're not frightened of a tough cop on the beat like those opposite who are opposing us having a tough cop on the beat with the ABCC. We believe it's important and that's why we have given them appropriate powers. 
But what would happen? What would happen if a royal commission actually went ahead? If it went ahead, there would be no legislation that deals with the misalignment of incentives in the life insurance sector. There would be no legislation that lifts the education and professional standards of financial advisers. There would be no changes to the current framework for dispute resolution, no one-stop shop for consumers to get access to justice easily and to access compensation. And there would be no process by which the banks would be held to account by the House Standing Committee on Economics for the decisions that they make, decisions that do affect all Australian consumers. We believe it's also important that we take action now to ensure that those people who have suffered harm are properly heard. That is why the Minister for Small Business and I took action in making sure that the Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman could provide a forensic review of the most egregious cases that were presented before the Parliamentary Joint Committee, to make sure that they could go through in very minute detail whether problems had occurred and, if so, what they were to prevent harm going forward. This is a very, very important review. And the Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman is an ombudsman with very significant powers, powers to compel documents from the banks, powers to compel them to come before the ombudsman to provide direct information on these very, very specific cases. It is incredibly important that those people who have been harmed by bad behaviour can access justice in a timely manner. So, what did those opposite do during their time when they had the ability to take action? They did very little at all. They certainly, as recently as 2015, did not support did not support Senator Wish Wilson when he stood up there in the Senate and proposed a royal commission. In fact, they opposed that. They opposed it very, very directly. They opposed it because they don't really believe it is necessary. They don't believe it's necessary, and they are putting their political interest ahead of the national interest. A royal commission, in fact, is very, very dangerous. It's very dangerous because what it would do, what it would do is it would send signals to people overseas. It would send signals to them that they cannot trust our banking system here in Australia, that there are structural problems with our banking system. It would have significant repercussions for confidence. It would have significant repercussions for international investment and it would have very significant repercussions for our AAA credit rating. So those opposite want to play populist politics with a very serious issue. Those on this side of the House are keen to address the significant issues that we know are relevant for individuals to be dealt with today, to be dealt with now, not three years from now. <coughs> so on that note, and before I continue to cough, I would like to commend to the House <coughs> the need <coughs> excuse me, to ensure <coughs> that those opposite do not succeed in their plan. <coughs> the member for Kennedy. Um, speaker, I have very great respect for the Deputy Prime Minister, but I do not think that he did himself a great deal of good today. I mean he would be well aware, or at least he should be well aware of the pain and agony that agriculture has gone through in Australia, in the dairy industry and in the cattle industry. And, uh, you know, it is said that we don't need an inquiry. Well, I'm saying again what I said previously in the week, but I think I should say it again. Um, there, were, there are only two people I know um, that have actually called on a Royal Commission, insofar as there are only two people rather than a parliament, and that was Bill Gunn and myself the Fitzgerald inquiry in Queensland. Now, we had a terrible problem with police. We had an inquiry after inquiry. The government is saying, you know, we'll have an inquiry into banking. Well, we had inquiry after inquiry. And, and you say, well, the government should have done something about it. Well, you try doing something about police corruption when it sets in. I can tell you it's a lot of fun. But once you had the Royal Commission, 
the spotlight of public opinion, and we couldn't find out who was at the heart of it, but that Royal Commission did find out who was at the heart of it. And we were able to remove that person, which we as the government could not do. Now, I share the government's fear that you know, where a Royal Commission goes, Menzies said you never have a Royal Commission unless you know what the answer is going to Never have an inquiry unless you know where the answer is going to be. Um, so I share their fears, and they're quite realistic fears. You know, if you look what happened to us in Queensland, um, in, in our efforts to get at the police, we were torn apart ourselves. Um, and so they're quite right in being worried about that. But if you say there is no requiry for banking, I mean, seriously, every person on that side of the House that has said that, I felt so sorry for the member for Dawson. There would not be a person in his electorate that would agree with that proposition. Not a single person in his electorate that would agree with that proposition, nor in most of the other electorates in Australia. But you know, I represent the agricultural and, and particularly the cattle industry. Well, you know, this is what the banking did for us. We got 750 million. We thank uh, Treasurer Swan and, and Treasurer Hockey uh, for that money. But the bank has organised so that we couldn't get a reconstruction board because they would lose a lot of business to the reconstruction board. I speak with authority because I was effectively head of the reconstruction board in Queensland. Um, and, and their antagonism towards us by putting another banking institution out there was enormous. So we had no banking institution. So uh, something like two thirds of the dairy farmers in Australia have gone. Um, there is a farmer doing away with himself every four days in this country, and no one seems to think that there's any problem. Well, I would say one in ten of those problems come from deficiencies in the banking system. Now, let me just zero in on a case. This was a case that Treasurer Swan thought was so important that he ordered ASIC, the head of ASIC, to meet with me twice. This was a problem that Treasurer Hockey thought was so important that he ordered ASIC to meet with me once. Here is a $200 million sugar mill owned by the farmers. It is sold out from under them for $2 million. Has anyone gone to jail? Was there any inquiry? Did ASIC do anything? I mean, in uh, Innisfail, where this occurred, they refer to ASIC not as a watchdog but as a lapdog. And of course, there's the figures. Anyone can find out. The mill was valued the year before. There was an offer for $56 million. The mill the year after was sold by the company for $76 million, but they bought it for $2 million. Now, the banks are going well. They have loaned money out for housing to a point where the housing values in the Greater Sydney area are $1 million, near enough to $1 million. The average income for an Australian is $75,000, and most Australians are well below that. But take out the tax and you're about $56,000, and of course if you're paying $970,000 for a house, there's your 56000 gone. And then you tell me there is no necessity for an inquiry. You are standing on the brink of a precipice. And every intelligent person in this country knows that you are standing on the brink of a precipice. And maybe you don't want the spotlight because it might indicate that the precipice is there. Oh. But I can assure you, everyone in this House, that the government and I don't mean to be offensive to the ALP, but I wouldn't be particularly, I would agree with the people on the other side, that I wouldn't be convinced that they would have done anything because they were there for three, three years. So I'm not making a partisan plea here. I'm simply saying to you that I, like the rest of Australia, would not have faith in this place to be able to address the problems of the banking industry. I would have faith in a Royal Commission because I've seen it at work and I've seen its enormous effectiveness in achieving the goals that it was after. Now, let me give you one other example. There is a very famous, now very famous case of a bloke called Charlie Fallot. So uh, the member from Mount Isa, Robbie Catter, 
your son calls a big meeting, and God bless the Deputy Prime Minister for going to that meeting, uh, a last stand meeting at Winton. And a, a bloke called David Pascoe wrote a letter about a bloke called Charlie Fallot. He said, a letter to my fellow Australians. And he concentrated on a bloke called Charlie Fallot. And if you want to see everything that's good about this country, meet Charlie Fallot, because he represents everything that is good about this country. My staff sat in the front of the screen reading the letter, and they were all were crying. My, mother, my, my wife sat in front of the screen. She burst out crying, and she formed a body to send out food and help to some of these people. Um, now, the spotlight was turned on this issue. Fallot had walked off. He owned nothing. The farm had fallen to pieces. Right? But when the spotlight of public attention was put on the bank, the chairman himself, God bless him, and I think he's a good man, the chairman himself, what's going on here? Charlie Fallot had his $2 million station returned to him, the debt of $2 million written off, and 750000 to put the station back in order. Now, 60 Minutes ran two segments on it, but this is the power of the spotlight. You give us no spotlight, then we've got no power. Right? And if there is one thing that I would agree strongly with the LNP about is that the ALP failed to do it. You know, the LNP has failed to do it. And believe me, in Queensland, we failed to weed out police corruption. Did the Royal Commission weed it out? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, so what I am saying is we want the spotlight and the power of public opinion, which was so enormously effective in the now famous case of Charlie Fallot. That, by the way, that letter got three and a half million hits. It was the highest ever recorded um, for a letter in Australian history on the internet. But it was pointing out the shortcomings of the bank. Well, I mean, the spotlight in itself is a redress. Now, we have had an inquiry into Woolworths and Coles. <laughs> you want to read it? It said, they are going to take over Australia. They've got 60 per cent of the market. They're increasing it 2.5 per cent of the year. You better do something about it. Did the government do anything about it? Successive governments? No. They now have nearly 90 per cent of the Australian food market. We had a dairy inquiry called on by Mr Costello. I'm not knocking him. I thank him for calling on the inquiry. Uh, another whitewash. There's nothing wrong with the dairy industry. Nothing except the 7,000 of the 15,000 dairy farmers have gone broke, bankrupt and walked off their, their properties worth absolutely nothing, um, nothing apart from that. And if you think you can achieve these objectives with all of the muscle power that we were able to bring on the cattle industry and secured $800 million in loans, do you know how many cattlemen got assistance from the government in Queensland? Four. One, two, three, four. The minister was advised that there are only 13 cattlemen at risk. Well, there had been 12 stations foreclosed on in the um, Caulfield area. Uh, that famous Charlie Flood said there were 12 foreclosed on in the Winton area. The Catholic priest in Longreach said that one quarter of the stations there was being foreclosed on. And you say, well, what's banking got to do with this? If we had a reconstruction board, no one would have been foreclosed on. No one would have been foreclosed on. And I speak with authority, because in Queensland, we did have a reconstruction authority. I happen to have been the minister with primary, not ultimate, but the primary responsibility. And we went in, time the, we were told that a third of the sugarcane farmers had to... The member for Kennedy will resume his seat, and I call the minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I note that the uh, <laughs> shadow treasurer over there, the uh, member for McMahon, has uh, declined to speak. Uh, his silence is deafening in the chamber. Okay, I'm being a, being a little bit presumptuous, but but I can say, I can say. Well, I'm, I'm going to be pleased to hear the, uh, the the member for McMahon. I'm going to be really pleased because because uh, indeed, when he was treasurer in 2013. Uh, the member for McMahon said, and I quote, the financial system is strong, well regulated and well managed, and I have not seen a case for a full-blown inquiry. That was when he was Treasurer, Mr Speaker. But uh, not just that. He also said 
that our two market guardians are the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, APRA and ASIC. The standard they set is world's best practice. Now, he said that when he was the Assistant Treasurer in an op-ed uh, entitled Good Place in an Economic Storm, published in uh, Fairfax's Sydney Morning Herald, 24 September 2008. So when given the opportunity, when given the opportunity, the member for McMahon didn't want a royal commission. Didn't want a royal commission. Now the big banks can and they will be accountable, Mr. Speaker. They can, they will be accountable. Australia's major banks are now going to be called to appear at least annually before Parliament. At least annually. They will be brought before the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics to report jointly to the Treasurer, Member for Cook, and the Parliament on our banking and financial system in Australia. And that is entirely right and appropriate. It's up to the banks to explain in full their actions to their customers so that customers can be fully informed when making their personal financial decisions. And of course, we live in a free market age in financial uh, markets where if people don't like what they're getting from the banks, they can walk to a uh, walk down the down the street to a customer-owned banking association facility. They can go to a credit union. Coming before the committee, this is the banks separately. The banks will have an opportunity to explain how they are responding to funding issues to support Australian consumers and businesses. And I'm proud to be the, the, the Minister for Small Business. Uh, small business is the engine room of the economy. It employs 4.7 million Australians. It accounts for $340 billion worth of economic good to this nation. Now, the appearance by the banks will ensure that they can transparently account for their decision making and how they balance the needs of borrowers, savers, shareholders and the wider community. This is important. The banks will be required uh, to explain to the parliamentary committee matters including uh, international economic and financial market developments and how these are affecting our nation. They will be required to explain, if necessary, developments in prudential regulation, uh, including capital requirements, how these are affecting the policies of Australian banks, Sounds good. The, the costs of funds, impacts on margins and the basis for bank interest rate pricing decisions. All these are good. All these are necessary. How individual banks and the banking industry as a whole is responding to issues previously raised in parliamentary inquiries through the necessary processes, uh, through their package of reforms announced in April this year, and uh, also uh, bank perspectives on the performance on the Australian economy, including strengths and potential risks. The coalition government has already taken significant, significant and proper steps to further strengthen our banking and financial system through the conduct of the Murray Financial System Inquiry and the ongoing implementation of the uh, recommendations of this particular report. In addition, the government has acted to strengthen the resources and the cap capability of ASIC. Uh, not just the investigative and reporting powers of a Royal Commission, but also the ability to prosecute and otherwise act against those responsible for malfeasance in the banking and financial <coughs> sector. And that is so totally right, so totally proper. Just yesterday, uh, Minister O'Dwyer and I uh, announced the, that the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, Kate Carnell, a very respected political and business figure. She has been directed to undertake an inquiry to assess whether current laws address the concerns raised by the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Financial Services in its report. It was tabled on May 4 uh, this year, uh, entitled Impairment of Customer Loans. The Ombudsman will examine selected cases identified by the Parliamentary Joint Committee and, uh, with the, uh, the terms of reference uh, provided, she will uh, give advice to the government to help determine if further regulatory action is required. That is right. That is proper. That is necessary. We are taking action. We do not need a royal commission into the banks. The PJC raised serious concerns about how banks treated some of their small business lending customers, and they made a number of recommendations to address the deficiencies they identified. The government has a substantial financial system <coughs> agenda to improve consumer outcomes. However, the Ombudsman will be able to identify through a forensic analysis if further reforms are needed, if they're required. Uh, Ombudsman Carnell will do that. She will provide interim findings to the Ramsey Review to inform the wider review of external dispute resolution schemes in the financial services sector. 
and the final report is due to be provided to the government in 12 weeks. Now, the government has recently announced that the major banks and other financial firms, as I said, are going to report annually. As I said, this is totally necessary. This approach will ensure that the banks and other major financial firms are more transparent in their decision making and they will be held account to the Australian people and by the Australian people. Now, I'd just like to, uh, to uh, put on hand sir, the terms of reference of this very important inquiry, which is going to be conducted by Ombudsman Carnell. And, and, and these, uh, these are uh, review a selection of the cases that have been identified by the PJC as unfair and ascertain whether there are any deficiencies in the regulation of authorised uh, deposit-taking institutions in lending to small businesses. And as I said, small business is the engine room of this economy. Uh, refer any matters identified in the review to the relevant authority for further consideration as necessary. Determine whether determine whether the regulatory deficiencies identified by the PJC or additional deficiencies identified throughout the, through the inquiry are being addressed by the subsequent government and industry <coughs> reforms, and also recommend whether additional reform measures should be implemented, uh, that is, legislation, regulations, guidance and practices, to ensure products perform in the way they should taking into account that consumers have a responsibility to accept their financial decisions. We know that. We appreciate that, uh, including market losses when they have been treated fairly and any impact on the availability and the cost of credit to small businesses. The government does not support a Royal Commission uh, into the banking and financial services sector uh, because a Royal Commission will not benefit consumers or the Australian economy. Uh, it will benefit lawyers. The Prime Minister made that point in question time today <laughs> and question time yesterday. Critically, a Royal Commission would, uh, would just go over old ground and would delay well-developed and important reforms which will strengthen consumer protections, ensure malpractice is detected and, where necessary, punished, and provide a one-stop shop for consumer complaints. In addition, a Royal Commission would send the signal internationally. That's the last thing we need that the government believes there are structural problems with our banking and financial sector. This would have a significant repercussion uh, for confidence, for international investment and, of course, for our all-important AAA credit rating. This, this uh, motion is a further demonstration that the Leader of the Opposition uh, is, is not fit to hold his current position. I mean, he had the opportunity. The, the, he had the opportunity. He was the Minister for Financial Services and Superannuation from the 14th of September 2010 to the 1st of July 2013. He was the Minister for Workplace Relations uh, from 2011 to 2013, and in that time, <coughs> he, he didn't call for a royal Member commission the into the Jager. banking sector. And when he was when he was uh, in charge of workplace relations, about the most notable thing that he did was was talk up the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, a tribunal, I might add. And I'm talking about the Member for Maribyrnong, um, a, a tribunal, I, I might add, that was going to place Riverina truck driving family businesses off the road and right throughout the nation. And it, took, it took a gallant effort by the Minister for, for Employment, Senator Michaelia Cash, and, and this side of parliament to absolutely strike that out, as we should have, as we should have, because family truck drivers keep this nation running. They keep this nation running. And, uh, and to have them put off the road was a damn disgrace, I must say. The government recognises that the financial services sector has not always lived up to the standards expected by the, by the Australian community. We, we understand that, and that is why this government is implementing the most significant package of reforms to the financial sector in recent history. We didn't see too much from that side when they were in government. Six sorry years in government, just racked up the debt and deficit, never called the for Minister a royal commission. Will address then, the topic of the motion, and shouldn't be calling for one now. Thank you. The minister's time has expired. Point of order. The manager of opposition business. Uh, Mr Speaker, understanding order 78, uh, because earlier you made a ruling which, when made, the House did not object to in any way, mm -hmm. uh, about whether or not there had been sufficient debate at that point of time. Every single speaker since that time, and I'll say on government, opposition and crossbench, has given speeches about whether or not the motion from the Senate should be supported. That is not the motion before the parliament. The motion before the parliament is whether or not we should deal with the Senate motion at the first available opportunity after 5.15pm. 
Given that the debate of the House has moved entirely now to the substantive motion rather than the motion that is before us, there is no doubt that the House is now ready to receive the motion that the question be put, and I therefore move that the no, question sorry, be put. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, as the manager of opposition business well knows, I know it's late in the day, but as Speaker I have a practice when either the Leader of the House or the Manager of Opposition Business uh, makes a point of order as a courtesy to hear from their counterpart. So I've heard the Manager of Opposition. No, I've just. No. No, so therefore I'll, I'll withdraw the motion that I moved and just leave it at the point of order That's until right. you've ruled. I was about to address the point of order, but I see the Leader of the House uh, wants to address the point of order, and uh, I give him that right. The Leader of the House on the point of order. Well, on the point of order, Mr Speaker, I think it's quite clear that the men members are talking <laughs> to the substantive uh, issues that face the Senate and the House of Representatives, which is not dealing with that matter now. Uh, and the reasons they're saying we shouldn't deal with those matters now is because of the government's policy with respect to uh, dealing with the banks versus the Labor Party's policy of a royal commission. But of course, if, if uh, you, Mr Speaker, directed the members of this side of the House to speak more to the uh, procedural motion. I'm sure they'd be quite prepared to do so, but no one has yet made that point. I thank um, both the Manager of Opposition Business and <laughs> the Leader of the House. Uh, the point the Manager of Opposition makes is that, uh, in his view, and to, to be fair, he says speakers on both sides, so includes the Leader of the Opposition in that. Uh, have strayed from a, a technical reading of the motion. That's his point. And you can have that argument. Uh, you can. I tend to, as you know, try to be practical about these things because uh, uh, having sat in this House for a long period of time and seen the consequences when you're <laughs> highly technical. But his substantive point was that because the speakers so far in the debate have had a consistency that he pointed out. That therefore means that future speakers uh, will adopt exactly the same attitude. And I've got to say that's a very unfair thing to say of future speakers in the debate. <laughs> so I'm not at the point yet where I, I feel that, you know, from my original ruling, we've had what, four <laughs> speakers on one side and two uh, on the uh, on the, uh, on the opposition side. If the opposition side doesn't wish to speak, that's their perfect right. Um, but I am going to hear further speakers. And of course, it's, all, it's been open right through to the debate for the manager of opposition business, if he's felt aggrieved by that, to have raised point of orders, points of order. Um, and I would have considered those points of order. Indeed, he could have even raised a point of order on the leader of the opposition. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I've heard him. I'm going to hear. I'm going to. I'm going to hear. I'm going to hear some some further speakers. Uh, I respect the fact he's withdrawn his motion, and uh, the minister's time had concluded. And I'll now call uh, the member for McMahon from. The well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, for a government which has spent a lot of time saying that there's no problem, has sure spent a lot of energy trying to find a solution. A government which says there's nothing to see here before an election has now found not one, but not two, but not three, but four solutions to a problem they not long ago denied existed. The problem is, Mr. D Mr. Speaker, none of those solutions will work. None of the solutions that the government has come up with will work, and they know it because they keep changing the answer. Originally, we were told the answer was more resources for ASIC. If we could just give more resources to ASIC, they could get on with the job. The problem, of course, was that they cut the resources before they put more in. So idea. the best they could do is come up with a level of resourcing which they inherited, which is no greater, not a dollar greater, than it was when they came to office. They said that was the solution. That had fixed the problems. Then they realised that actually that wasn't going to cut the mustard. So then we had the next brainwave, an annual chat by the banks with the member for banks. They said, now the Prime Minister said, I assure you, this will change behaviour. This will change the way the banks operate. If they get called in once a year to sit 
not with a Senate committee, not with a joint committee, but a government-dominated House committee to answer questions. That would the somehow change behaviour. Member for McMahon will resume his seat. The, the Leader of the House. I move that the debate be adjourned. Okay, the Leader of the House. Yeah, the, the Leader of the House is entitled to move that motion, but not while someone's speaking. So the member for McMahon has the call. Christopher, Christopher, Christopher. So we were told that an annual chat with the member for Banks would change behaviour. And now the latest solution is a tribunal, of which we have no detail. No information. We don't know how it will work with the Financial Services Ombudsman or other uh, tribunals that already exist. We already have some of these tribunals in existence, and now a new tribunal, we're told, will fix it. And then, of course, we had the latest solution by the Minister for Small Business, who was such a triumph in the census, such a triumph for public administration. He's now sent a referral of an inquiry to the Small Business Ombudsman, who is the former Chief Minister of the ACT. Now, forgive us for not being blown over and impressed with that little stunt, Mr Speaker, that that is somehow going to fix all the problems. Now, the Prime Minister does not want a Royal Commission into Financial Services. He's got some experience in Royal Commissions into Financial Services, and it hasn't gone too well in the past. So no wonder he doesn't want a Royal Commission into Financial Services on this occasion. And the government thinks it's clever to go through some of the scandals and some of the crises that occurred when Labor was in office and when I and the now Leader of the Opposition had ministerial responsibility. Well, we're happy to talk about that because that's just why the Leader of the Opposition and I know that a Royal Commission is necessary. Because the Leader of the Opposition and I have spent a long time meeting with victims. I spent time in office meeting with victims. I've met with the victims at TRIO. I know the victims of Timber Corp. I know the victims of bad financial advice. And that's why I and this Leader of the Opposition put through the financial advice reforms that we did. And you know who voted for them? Labor Party members. You know who voted against them? Liberal and National Party members on every single occasion. And you know what else Liberal and National Party members did? They went to the 2013 election. They went to the 2013 election and said, oh no, we can, we can live with these reforms now. That's okay. And then they won the 2013 election and then they tried to overturn them. And in fact, it's worse, Mr. Speaker. They actually succeeded in overturning them for a period of time. They had the numbers in this House. They managed to get the numbers in, that, in the other place, and they actually legislated to water down the labour protections which we had put in office. They actually voted successfully to provide less protection to Australian consumers of financial advice. That was one of their big priorities when it came to financial reform. That was their big agenda. To, re to ignore the lack of mandate, to spend their resources, their political capital, their energy to water down protections on financial advice. But the Senate was a wake up. The Senate worked out. Crossbenchers in the other place knew that they had been had. And then it was put again in the Senate and their repeal was overturned. I say to the government, shame on you for trying to water down our protections. Shame on you for leaving victims of financial advice to the vagaries of dodgy advice. We'll talk about the things which happened when we were in office, and that's why we understand, because they are still happening. As good as the financial advice reforms are, as important as they are, we still see scandals. And you know what, Mr Speaker? We know who perpetrated some of those scandals, and some of those people are still working in financial services today. Some of those people are still in the, in the sector and the industry, and we know that a royal commission is what's necessary to deal with the culture, with the structure, with the things which bring about crisis after crisis and scandal after scandal. Now, we know that an eminent Australian or Australians properly versed, properly versed in the nature of Australia's financial services system is what is necessary to shine a light. We all know that what royal commissions can do, what benefits they can bring. We've called royal commissions in the past for the right reasons in office, and thank goodness we did. And they had their naysayers. They had people who said they weren't necessary, or well, not many people say they're not necessary now. We know that the Liberal Party and National Party have no in principle objections to royal commissions. They're not slow in calling them when they think it suits their political interests. They don't mind spending taxpayers' money 
on, a, on, on royal commissions, Mr. Speaker, which are designed to further the political interests of those who sit opposite. But they are determined to avoid it when, it when it promotes not their political interests but the national interests, the interests of victims of financial scandals. Now, the Prime Minister lectures and he says the victims of financial scandals don't want a royal commission. Well, how would he know? Because he doesn't talk to them. How would he know? Because he doesn't meet with them. How would he know? Because he does not engage with the victims of financial scandals. And you know what? It is true. It is true that some of them say it won't help me. It is true that some of the victims of financial scandals say the damage is done for me. But having been through it, having lost my life savings, in many instances having seen my family break up and in some tragic instances having lost members of their family, they do not want to see it happen to another Australian. They do not want to see it happen to another family. They know that something has to change. They know that the culture has to change. They know that the system has to change, and they know that tinkering won't do it. They know that a royal commission will. They know that a royal commission, actually properly constituted with the powers and authority necessary, will get to the bottom of what they went through. How have we found out about the scandals that have occurred so far, Mr. Speaker? Is it because the banks and the financial services providers and the financial advisers have come out and said, look, we want to just reveal to the Australian people we've got a little problem here? No, it is not. It is because they have been exposed. They've been exposed, I've got to say, Mr. Speaker, by investigative journalists in many instances. And I want to, in the House, pay due credit to one in particular. Australia owes a debt of gratitude to Adele Ferguson, who has, who has pursued these issues with a passion and a tenacity. Who's, it is due to her and her investigative journalism that many of these scandals have come to light. But Australia shouldn't be reliant on one journalist or even on more than one journalist. Australians shouldn't be reliant on one media outlet to examine these issues. Australians are reliant on us, on everybody in this House to do their job, on everybody in the other House to do their job. And they're reliant on us to make sure that the proper procedures are in place and resources are given. And they know that the Royal Commission is the way to do that, not with all due respect to Adele Ferguson, who's a very fine journalist. But she can only do so much, and the other investigative journalists can only do so much. They most of these inquiries and and scandals haven't been brought to light by ASIC. With all due respect to ASIC and the work they do, they've been brought about by people outside government, outside the system of government. And that cannot be allowed to stand for one day more, Mr Speaker. This House has the opportunity tonight to send a message to the government. Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The member for McMahon will resume his seat. Mr. The Speaker. Yeah, I can hear the, the manager of opposition business. I'm trying sir. to answer him. The manager of opposition okay, business on a point of order. Understanding order 78A, I move that the member for McMahon's time be extended by an additional 15 minutes. Uh, I refer. I, I thank. No, the member for McMahon will resume his seat, as will the manager of opposition business. That motion is not in order. You can move an extension of time, but if you look to page three of the standing orders, you see it can't exceed half. The original speaking times. Then I'll move that the member for McMahon's time be extended by the maximum allowed under the standing orders, which is five minutes. Okay. The manager of opposition business has moved that the member for McMahon's time be extended by five minutes. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. I think the noes have it. The ayes have division required. Division is not required. Well, thank the house more if we actually do the right thing by Australian financial consumers and say to this prime minister, do the right thing and call a royal commission. Now, Mr. Speaker, only the executive can call a royal commission. Only the executive can determine the terms of reference. Only the executive can advise the Governor General. That's why it's called a Royal Commission, because it's got to have the assent of the Governor General. But I tell you what, this House can express its will. This House can say to the elected government of the day, this is what we want you to do. And if this Prime Minister and this Treasurer and this Executive ignore the will of this House, then they will be showing more than their incompetence. They will be showing more than their lack of willingness to embrace the best interests of Australian financial consumers. They will be showing above all their arrogance. 
their willingness to ignore the wish of the other place and this place, their willingness and their determination to use all the powers of the executive to ignore the wishes of elected members of the House of Representatives. Now, members tonight have an opportunity to look into their conscience. And I say this in all seriousness, Mr Speaker. I say this in all seriousness to people on goodwill on the other side of the House, those who have called for royal commission in the past, those who have argued for a royal commission in the past, those who have tweeted about a royal commission in the past, those who have been part of inquiries of this House and the other place that have made the case eloquently and powerfully for a royal commission. Now is the time for delivery. Now is the time when you can absolutely do it. Now is the time when elected members of this House can stand up for this House's rights, for this House's responsibilities and obligations, Mr Speaker, and all of our responsibilities to our constituents. We all, Mr Speaker, represent Australians who have been the victims of financial scandals. But I'll tell you what, Mr Speaker, even more importantly than that. We represent people who might be the victims of future financial scandals. We represent people who may be subject to this sort of behaviour in the past, and we can stop it happening. We can't stop the scandals of the past, but we can put in place the laws to stop it happening in the future. How will we feel if we don't? How will those members who have called for a royal commission in the past feel if they don't? When there's another scandal and, we ha and if we have ignored our possibility tonight to call a royal commission, how will we feel? Well, I tell you what, Mr. Speaker, I know how members on this side of the House will feel. We will feel that we've done the right thing, but we'll be angry, as many millions of Australians will be angry, that this opportunity was lost. So, Mr. Speaker, we don't detain the House lightly tonight. We don't detain the House because uh, this is something that we want to do for fun. We detain the House tonight because this is a matter of vital national importance. Here, here. We detain the House tonight because the Australian people are watching and waiting for real action. We detain the House tonight because the time for talk is over and the time for action is now. We detain the House tonight because this House can send a signal to this arrogant Prime Minister that the time has come to put the Australian people first. The time has come to put victims of financial scandals first. The time has come to put future victims of financial scandals first by avoiding those scandals by having a properly, thoroughly constituted and well-resourced Royal Commission run by eminent Australians, run by people who understand the importance of a well-regulated financial services system. This can be done tonight. I say to the Prime Minister, sometimes you just have to know when you've lost. Sometimes you just have to know when it's time to recognise reality. Sometimes you just have to know when it's time to say, OK, I might have got this one wrong. So I know it's not in your nature, Prime Minister. I know it's not, I know it's not something that comes naturally to the Prime Minister, but I've got to say, I think the Australian people will react well to a Prime Minister who said, I've got this one wrong. I've heard the message. I want to work with the Labor Party and the crossbenchers, and I will deliver a royal commission. That might not have been my idea, might not have been something I thought was great, but I've been convinced in the national interest. This is one, this is one Mr. Speaker, where the Prime Minister can actually put the national interest instead of in front of his political interest. This is one where he doesn't need to listen to the right wing in his cabinet. He can listen to millions of Australians and, and can say, I get it. I hear the message. I will deliver a royal commission because the Australian people deserve it. I will deliver a royal commission because the Australian people deserve nothing less. And I'll deliver a royal commission because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. The Leader of the House. I move the debate be adjourned. The Leader of the House has moved that the debate be adjourned. And the resumption yet yeah, the question is that the debate be adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <laughs>
separately is whether that be adjourned to the next sitting or whether it can be adjourned to a later hour this day. Yeah. That question isn't before the House right, the and fun. therefore uh, that is an issue that we would ask needs to be resolved in addition to this and we point this out uh, so that it's very clear uh, to the House what they're voting on. Mm. Well, the leader of the House moved that the debate be adjourned, and that's I can put the question that's before the chair, which which, which I've done. It's not a criticism of you, Mr. Speaker. It's of someone else. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> we'll have this division. <laughs> The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Gray and Dawson tell us for the ayes and the honourable members for Fowler and Morton tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 73, noes 72. The question now is the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The Leader of the House. I move that the motion be put. The Leader of the House has moved that the motion be put. The Leader of the House was on his feet. and uh, you, you were not at the dispatch. The, man the manager of opposition business will resume his seat. I'm being as patient as I can with both sides. You were not at the dispatch box. The Leader of the House was at the dispatch box. You cannot take a point of order until you're at the dispatch box. Otherwise, people could take them from the fourth row out of their chair. The Leader of the House has moved the motion be put. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. The question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion, uh, the ayes will pass the right of the chair, I should say, the nose to the left. I point the same tellers as for the previous division.
reiterate to the tellers that it's a successive division. It's a one-minute division. Members need to report to the tellers if they're changing their votes or they've entered the chamber. <laughs> so to the tellers with the successive one-minute division, unless anyone's entered the chamber or they're changing their vote, we need to report to you. Point of order from the Leader of the House. Yes. As you have stated, and the tellers are not actually following your instructions, there is no reason for them to do a full vote. It's a successive division. And as no one has reported to them, they can report the result to you immediately. Yes, and the Manager of Opposition Business, the Member for Grainler. Member for Grainler will cease interjecting. I've made the point to the to the tellers that it's a successive division. So do we you, need to count? You don't need to do a full count. That's the point of a successive division, a one-minute division. Excuse me to the Leader of the Opposition. I'm not giving the tellers a hard time. I'm Order the result of the division is ayes 73, noes 72. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. No, division required. Yes, Ring the bells for one minute. I point the same tellers as the previous division and let me restate it would be helpful if members were to remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber or did not vote in the previous division or they are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Point of order. Speak. Point of order. Yes, point of order, the Manager of Opposition Business. Mr Speaker, you just stated the question to the House on what mm. we're, we're voting on now. Was that the first time you've stated the question? No, the I stated it and then, and then the closure was moved. Okay. So we've had the closure. Now that's done. Now we go back to the question. You've been in here a long time. <laughs> well, have, but it's, no. I stated it. And you were trying to take a point of order out of your seat when the Leader of the House came to the dispatch box and moved the closure. If I'm not out of my seat, I'm not allowed to take a point of order. I can't do it sitting down. Well, we're not going to have a discussion. You've made your point of order. Lock the doors. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for the next sitting. Members must remain in their seat unless they're changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers.
The result of the division is ayes 73, no 72. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Leader of the House. I move that the House do now adjourn. The Leader of the House has moved that the House do now adjourn. The, I'd like to say that the, we the, should. The Leader of the House. Put. The Leader of the House has moved that the motion be put. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I no. think the ayes have it. No, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. And I'll say it again. I repeat, appoint the same tellers as per the previous division. It would be helpful if members were to remain in their seats during the successive division unless they're leaving the chamber, or they did not vote in the previous division, or they're changing their vote, in which case they need to report to the tellers. The ma uh, member for Grainler on a point of order. No, I've ruled a one-minute division. There wasn't subsequent debate. Great speech. I hadn't called you. I hadn't called you. <laughs> I realise you're following the ancient tradition, but I can't actually see you at all on this <laughs> angle. <laughs> so, lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Excessive division. The result of the division is ayes 73, no 72. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I, the question now is that the House do now adjourn. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, it. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. Remind members to stay in their seats unless they're changing their vote.
the doors aren't locked and 94A still applies. There's lots of places you can muse. Lock the doors. Members must remain in their seat unless they're changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is I 73, no 72. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative, and the House stands adjourned until Monday, 12th of September 2016, at 10 a.m.